Hi, I'm MJ4Z, and welcome to my Ham Shack. Uh, I am part of the York County Amateur Radio Society in York County, South Carolina. And this is the first part of a multi-part series on the fundamentals of antenna and antenna design and the math behind antennas. In this first session, we're going to talk about the terms and properties of electromagnetic waves that will help us build to the properties of antennas which will then lead us to the math and design of antennas, or the fundamental antennas anyways. Uh, so sit back, enjoy, hope you learned something from this, and uh, let's get started. Okay, so let's get started with the basics um, and the fundamentals of electromagnetic waves and fields. Okay, so I'm going to change my screen here real quick, bring this up, and now you can see a picture um, here. And what we have is we've got a uh, wire that is um, carrying a current, which is DC power, okay? Um, and it forms a magnetic field. When we have current moving through a wire, magnetic field will form around that wire. And it's a static field. It's called an H field. Okay. Now, the difference is when we start talking about radio frequency and, and emitting RF from our transceivers, we are talking about an alternating current flowing through a conductor. And what that's going to do is it's going to induce a magnetic field, but that in field is going to be an alternating magnetic field um, in relation to the alternating current or electric field that we have. So we have an E field and an H field, just like we did in the DC. But at this time, these things are alternating. Okay, so the voltage along the E field is going to climb and fall and, and go back up again over a period of time and also the magnetic field is going to vary and those are related okay in amplitude and when we talk about them moving we talk about them moving in vectors they have amplitude and direction okay so there's two components it's just not a direction with an with a uh, electromagnetic wave okay these two fields are going to be perpendicular to each other okay at 90 degrees Okay. They are also coupled, so you can't separate one from the other. Okay, If you have an alternating current in a wire, you're going to have an alternating magnetic field. Okay, If you have an alternating magnetic field, you're going to have current induced in a wire. Right? They are coupled. They don't exist without each other. Okay, Again, they travel at right angles to each other, and they'll move in counterclockwise or clockwise ways. It determines on how that wave propagates and what direction it's moving. They're made up of an infinite number of wave fronts. We'll talk a little bit about wave fronts a little bit later, uh, but just know this is kind of uh, the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, infinity, as long as that wave is moving. Okay. These two fields, again, they're coupled, so they move in unison, and they move at the same speed. Okay, And that speed is the speed of light through the medium which they are passing. Okay. Now that sounds like odd phraseology, but we have to make it that way. Okay. Because things are not always equal when you're passing through different types of materials or mediums. Okay. So when we talk about the speed of light, okay, traditionally everybody knows this is the letter C in equations, famous equations like E over MC squared. Okay. Einstein's theory of general relativity. Okay. Or special relativity. Um, C is the speed of light in a vacuum or free space. Okay, light travels very quickly, so over one second, light will travel 300 million meters or 983 million 600,000 feet. 
Like I said, it was fast. Okay. All light and electromagnetic waves, and, and light is an electromagnetic wave. Um, they travel at that same velocity through free space. Okay. Now, when we get into something different, say glass, water, another type of medium, there's resistance to the wave passing through, and that's coefficient of our dielectric constant of that material. I'm sorry, not coefficient, dielectric constant of that material. It's represented as K. Okay. So just realize light doesn't flow through different mediums at the same speed. Okay. Uh, in free space and in a vacuum, it's always the speed of light C. Okay. When you talk about other mediums, it's going to be a percentage of C. Okay. And when we get that percentage, or the velocity factor is one divided by the square root of K, which is that dielectric constant, okay? It's always a real number, okay? So it's always between zero and one because it's a percentage. If you have a C uh, or a, a uh, velocity factor of one, that means you're in free space or vacuum, okay? If you have um, a velocity factor of zero, you're in a black hole and not a good place to be. Um, so anyways, just know it's between zero and one. And this velocity factor is going to be specific for an application, a medium, a cable. Okay. So, um, just know that not everything travels at the same speed. Okay. Unless you're in a vacuum or in free space. Okay. And we use this, this velocity factor later on down the road to talk about electrical lengths of cables. So just know the velocity factor is important and how it's what it is, okay? It's the percentage of the speed of light through which the electromagnetic wave is propagating through a medium, okay? So let's talk about frequency, okay? We all know electromagnetic waves are made up of a multiple part of wave fronts, okay? And those wave fronts, um, basically it's a wave form, okay? And you're looking at it from an end, you have a wave front. But one oscillation of that waveform, okay? So we talk about one oscillation of waveform, so zero to its peak amplitude back to zero to the negative peak amplitude back to uh, zero again is one waveform, okay? How many waveforms that wave repeats through a period of time is its wavelength, or its frequency, excuse me, its frequency, okay? So for our purposes, we use one second and we measure in hertz. So one waveform through one second means one hertz, as the diagram shows you. And as we go, as we add more waveforms, the frequency increases. So now we're at five hertz. Okay. So that's five waveforms per second. Okay. We express this in our mathematical equations as a symbol uh, italics F, lowercase f. Okay. So you hear me call it F, it's frequency. Okay. And again, this is time flowing this way. This is our waveform on here. Okay. Uh, just know that frequency is the number of times that waveform is repeated in one second measured in hertz. Now, frequency and wavelength are related, okay? So wavelength is the distance of one waveform over um, one waveform, how far it travels um, in free space, okay? Again, we're talking about free space, so we're talking about C, the speed of light in free space or in a vacuum. Okay, So we want to know how far that wave propagates in one waveform. Okay, So when we talk about wavelength, we're going to talk about the le Greek letter lambda. Okay, And lambda looks like a funny bent L, I guess. Um, that is the symbol for wavelength. Okay? And the wavelength of a specific frequency can be determined by its velocity in free space. So we come up with the equation lambda equals C over F. So that's wavelength equals the speed of light divided by the frequency. Okay. Should make perfect sense. 
It's how they're related. It's all by the speed of light. Okay. Now, frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional. Okay, and this becomes very important. So the higher the frequency of the wave, the shorter the wavelength. Okay, so as many times as that thing repeats itself in one second means those waves get ever shorter the faster it repeats itself. It won't travel as far in one wavelength as it would in something saying that it would repeat itself one time through one second. Okay, So if we have a one hertz wave, we can tell that that would be a certain wavelength versus something where we have a 50 hertz wave. Okay, So if you look at this diagram, these two waves are propagating okay these two red dots although they're moving at different speeds are same plane vertically okay in this drawing they are not moving in the dire either direction here laterally along that wave they are set at a vertical point here they're not moving laterally okay all they're doing is tracing the waveform. This one looks like it's racing along, and this one looks like it's pretty slow. Um, but they're at the same point in time. Okay, So again, higher frequency, we have a smaller wavelength. Long, lower frequencies, we have a longer wavelength. Okay, That's how they're related. And you can figure out, again, the wavelength of a, of a wave, of an of a electromagnetic wave, by taking the speed of light divided by the frequency. Okay, that leads us to a big equation. Okay, and when we deal with big numbers, it's always tough to do things in your head or on a calculator because you're punching a bunch of zeros. So if we take the speed of light in a vacuum for meters or in feet and we divide it by the frequency in hertz, we get how long the waveform is or one waveform is. Okay, we can shorten this formula all these numbers because we're dealing in millions of hundreds of millions of feet or meters per second and we're dealing in frequencies that are um, millions of hertz long we can divide the entire equation by one million okay and we the numerator and the denominator by a million and we come up with a simple formula of 299.8 divided by the frequency in megahertz, okay? So if this is 7,150,000 hertz, it's 7.150 megahertz, okay? We're just dividing this by a million, we're dividing this by a million. So those gives us a, those that trick of math gives us two very easy formulas, whether you're using meters or, or imperial measurements in feet, okay? For me, I tend now to do everything in meters because most of the world operates in the metric system and we use all our bands in meters. So it's a heck of a lot easier for me to try to figure out um, this formula than take this formula and divide that by 3.028 to go from feet to meters, okay? Um, <laughs> yeah, can you imagine somebody calling CQ, CQ, CQ? This is the 137 foot band calling CQ, yeah, that doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, you could do it, and you'd be technically correct, but for that matter, you can call out uh, CQ, the 2.08 chain band, or CQ.208 furlong band, okay? And for those of you who are going, what the heck's a chain or a furlong? A chain is actually a measurement, and I think it's um, 66 feet. And a furlong is 10 chains, so it's 660 feet. And you can do the math from there and see why I came up with 2.08 and 2.8. But just being facetious there, we call things out in meters. So I tend to use 299.8. Some people round it to 300. Um, I'm a little stickler for having proper numbers. So 2.998 divided by frequency in megahertz gives you that. But remember... This formula is super important, right? We're going to use it a ton. Very few parts of this lecture series or any of the math we're going to do or any of the, the math you're going to do when you're building your antennas or designing your antennas 
you're going to be using this formula. Very, very few times will you not hear wavelength, frequency, phase, okay? Um, those things are all going to be in the lexicon from here on out, okay? Which brings us to phases, okay? Waves and phases. So what is phase? Phase is essentially is time, okay? When we talk about a waveform and wavelengths and frequencies, okay? If you see our sinusoidal waveform here, right? When you talk about wavelength, you're talking about the distance that travels along this axis, okay? So um, if this was wave, one waveform here, we could use our formula to determine how long this waveform is in distance, okay? Talk about frequency, we're talking about this as time, okay? That's where phase comes in. So your frequency is how many times this waveform repeats itself over a given space of time, one second. In our case, if this was a one second time period, we would have something that repeated itself three, four times, right? One, two, three, four times. So we would have um, a, it's oh, yeah, one, that's two, that's three and a half times, excuse me. I knew that wasn't right. Three and a half times. So our frequency would be 3.5 hertz if this was one second, okay? So we talk about phase. It's a relative measurement of time between or within waveforms, okay? I know that kind of sounds weird, but let's just look at it, okay? So here and here and here are the same points on the waveform at a different point in time, okay? So we had come up here and we're here on this waveform, come up here and we're here on this waveform, come up here and we're here on the waveform. So you can see all three of those points, A, B, and C, are at the same point in the wave, waveform at a different point in time, okay? The next diagram becomes a little clearer if I show you this. Okay, again, A, B, and C, same point, and the waveform over a different period of time, okay? Now, we have a second wave here, and this wave started earlier than this wave form, okay? So, if this is the same period of time, this wave's down here at the bottom of its cycle and coming back up, so its waveform is actually here, okay? And then it goes again, repeats here, and goes again and repeats here. This one starts at zero, so when it gets back to zero the second time, it's waveforms there, okay? Now, these points A, B, and C on this wave are at the exact same point in the waveforms as A, B, and C here at the top. So if we overlay these two waves, okay, on the same axis of time, then we have a difference of time, okay, a difference of distance. These things have traveled over that same period of time because of the way the waves are, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, distance and time, not in distance and in, in, not distance overall. They're at a different point in time, okay? So if you look at this, this is basically when you look at one waveform, you go up, down, or zero, a minimum, and then back to zero, okay, and the amplitudes. So each wave is 360 degrees. So if we take a look at this, when we get to the top, we're at 90, 180, 270, 360, okay? We're also, if you talk about distance, we're at one quarter wave, one half wave, three quarter wave, uh, one full wave, okay, of distance, okay? So now we look at this differential between this point and this point, which are on the same point of the waveform, but a different point in time. So that wave has, this wave is ahead by one quarter of a wavelength in time. And it's also 90 degrees ahead of this same point here along the axis. Okay. So in the wave, it's 90 degrees ahead of where this one is. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, these are all the same points on the waveform at different points in time. That's what we talk about when we're talking about phase. Okay, polarization is dependent on the directions of the line of force. We get a lot of questions about polarization. Is it 
you know, horizontal, vertical, what does it mean? Okay. So if the EM field, when you look at the EM wave and it's a big cross and you've got, you know, your vertical portion is your electrical part of that EM wave, then it's vertically polarized. If we swap it, now it's the horizontal portion and it's parallel to Earth, it's horizontally polarized. Now, as waves travel through the atmosphere, they get kind of turned and bumped and you'll end up with an elliptical um, polarization where you have part of its vertical, part of its horizontal, and it turns into an ellipse. You can also build an antenna specific so that it rotates 360 degrees, that field, um, over one wavelength, and you get a circular polarization. But for our for our purposes here, we're going to talk about horizontal and vertical polarizations, and that's it. Okay, but I just want you to understand it's dependent upon the electrical part of that wave. Okay, field intensity. It's a measurement of the strength of the wave at a distance from the radiating point or the antenna. Okay, so when we go down field from the antenna, this wave's propagating. We want to know how strong that wave is. That's its field intensity. And it's measured in voltages between two points on the wave front. For radio waves, typically we're talking about millivolts and microvolts of, of field intensity, not full volts. Okay, And it varies uh, inversely to the distance. So basically if you have a just for numbers of 100 millivolt per meter uh, field intensity at 100 meters away from the antenna, it's going to half itself when you double the distance. Okay. So it would be 50 millivolts at 200 meters. Okay. So field intensity um, also relates to power density. Okay. So we start talking about power density. Um, power density is just basically equating the energy in that wave from field intensity to power. So not talking about voltage, we're talking about actual power. And that requires you knowing the um, impedance of the air. So that would be, and that's in free space, it's 377 ohms. It's pretty much a constant. Okay. So you would take the voltage and divide it by the um, resistance and that gives you power. And that's going to be measured in milliwatts or micro uh, watts per meter squared. Okay. Just a little aside, we're not really going to talk into power density a whole lot, but I wanted you to understand that it's related to intensity. In case somebody talks to you about power density and field intensity, that they're related. And basically, those two um, are related by the power formula. The field intensity, or I'm sorry, the power density, uh, it, it varies by the square root of the distance. Okay, the square of the distance, excuse me, um, as it travels away. So if the power density is 4 milliwatts at, or uh, meters per squared at, at 100 meters, it's going to be 1 milliwatt at 200 meters. So um, you go, you start taking the square of the distance, okay? So when you double it, it's going to, you know, you double the distance, it's going to take it by the square. So you have, um, you have those losses over time. And those losses, okay, over distance is attenuation. I know that's a long way to, round to get around to attenuation, but basic it's the loss of the power density or the field intensity um, as the wave propagates away from the antenna, okay? We, we lose power as we go away, and that's attenuation. So you'll, you'll learn more about that as we go. But keep in mind, when we talk about attenuation, there's mathematical attenuation, then there's real-world attenuation, okay? Because we know uh, point A to point B is not always a clear, straight shot of free space or vacuum. Uh, there'll be trees in the way. There'll be buildings in the way. Um, you know, the atmosphere plays part of it, how propagation is with the atmosphere. So your attenuation of that signal is going to vary due to absorption. It's going to vary due to, um, you know, the objects in your way. It's going to deal with refraction, reflection. So there's very, very, very many variables that come into play when you're talking about attenuation. 
So your theoretical or mathematical attenuation can be very different from your real world attenuation. Okay, so we hope you learned something from this and it was entertaining for you. Uh, please hit the subscribe and like button and also the bell for notifications. Uh, helps us with the algorithm, helps us to get introduced to other uh, possible subscribers and other folks and carries the message of ham radio out to the world. So uh, we would appreciate that. Again, I hope you found it entertaining and helpful. Uh, with that, I'll say 73 from the York County Amateur Radio Society in York County, South Carolina. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay passionate about amateur radio because we are, and we are Y-Cars. 73 all, good evening.